Hello. Welcome to the Bookman's Corner. I'm very pleased to introduce our guest author, Dr. Gary Kaplan, who is a pioneer of integrative medicine and is a clinical associate professor at Georgetown University and director of the Kaplan Center for Integrative Medicine in McLean, Virginia. He wrote the book, Total Recovery, Solving the Mystery of Chronic Pain and Depression with Donna Beach, a New York Times collaborator. Dr. Kaplan, welcome to the Bookman's Corner. Lois, thank you. I found it interesting that best-selling medical author Dr. Andrew Wheel wrote that your book offers a potentially game-changing insight, which is the neurological key to the inflammation that keeps patients in a perpetual cycle of pain and depression. And for more than 100 million Americans who suffer from it, chronic pain often returns at the slightest provocation, even when doctors cannot find anything that's wrong. You wrote that in the 1970s, many Americans started to realize that conventional medicine did not have all the answers. Tell us what happened to James Reston, the New York Times correspondent who accompanied President Nixon on his historic trip to China in 1971. So 1971, Scotty Reston was part of the advance team mm -hmm. uh, in preparation of Nixon's trip. Uh, during that trip, he developed an acute appendicitis and he's rushed to the anti-imperialist hospital in Beijing. Okay. He undergoes a conventional uh, appendectomy. Postoperatively, he develops abdominal pain, which we would refer to as an ileus. And uh, they call in the staff acupuncturist, Reston more than a little bit skeptical, yes. cedes to having this, uh, this treatment done. And very shortly after having the needles placed, uh, the pain goes away completely, the ileus resolves, and he's able to uh, be released from the hospital without any further complications. He wrote about this, and it really caught the imagination of the American public. Mm -hmm. Acupuncture had been practiced for years in this country, but mostly within Chinatowns uh, mm -hmm. and among ethnic minorities not uh, practiced widely throughout the country. Uh, with Reston, it gave people permission to begin to look into this uh, form of treatment and, made, and opened up a whole new uh, era of medicine in this country. Well, how did the practice of acupuncture impact Western medicine, you think? Well, I think it's had a, a, a number of major impacts on it. One of the things is we were looking at acupuncture. Uh, it was part of uh, some of the research uh, process of this early on. And we were looking at acupuncture, uh, trying to understand how it worked. I mean, mm -hmm. it didn't make any sense from a Western standpoint. And in the process of trying to understand that, it unveiled to us a whole uh, piece of the human physiology that we didn't understand previously. And what was that? Taught us about how nerves talk to one another in one sense. So mm -hmm. the use of endorphins that we were able to manipulate the uh, so there was an endorphinergic and what's called a dynorphinergic pathway. So these were ascending and descending pain pathways in the in the brain, the body. Um, acupuncture elaborated on a lot of how of those pathways worked. We knew about those pathways before acupuncture, of course, but we didn't know we could manipulate them through such techniques as acupuncture. Acupuncture has also taught us a lot, we find that the body works in different ways than we thought it did. Okay. So, for instance, in people who suffer with fibromyalgia, which is generalized pain syndrome, sure. we find that when we do acupuncture on them, what changes is they have a lot of endorphins in their central nervous system. So that's the body's own natural opioids. And then what happens is the problem is the sensitivity of the opioid receptors, uh, not the amount of opioids. And so giving people uh, pain medication for fibromyalgia frequently isn't really effective. And the reason it's not effective is because their receptors, the things that need to be turned on in order to make the pain medicine effective, aren't uh, working properly. Right. Acupuncture helps make them work better. So it helps the body's own immune system be stronger then, right? It, it can help the body's own immune system. Yeah. It helps the body's own neurologic system. system. Uh, it, it's a homeostatic process. It, it helps rebalance the body. Interesting, interesting. Now, you wrote in your book that we started to have incredible access to information about our bodies. I mean, how did medicine change in the 1990s? So. What started to change was our ability to access imaging and um, That's biomarkers. The, uh, scats, the, the scans, Cat, right? Cats, well, so x-ray is an image, mm -hmm. but imaging now became the term, okay? So previously, it was all about x-rays, and right. then it became about CAT scans, right. okay? Which is a, just a fancier form of an x-ray. Okay. And then in 1985, actually, the first MR scanners came on board. These are the magnetic resonant imaging uh, scanners. Okay. That allowed us to see a level of detail that we had never previously seen in the body. We were able to view things that we'd never saw So you saw can see before. the tissue in depth. 
right? The body. We the, could the, so as opposed to just looking at the bones, now we could look at the tendons, the ligaments, uh, the muscles, the muscles, and the organs themselves. Okay. Uh, whereas before they were just shadows. So now we had a great deal of, of of data available to us that we'd never seen previously, and that was starts in 1985. The, the average physician has access to that information. Okay. And then that escalates as we our research uh, data. One of the things that happens in any field is that when you digitalize it that information spreads rapidly and grows exponentially. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as in Moore's law, which says that every 18 months, the capacity, the memory capacity of a chip is going to increase uh, or double. And we're finding the exact same thing happens with virtually every other field that becomes digitalized. Okay. So in medicine, uh, as computers became more readily available, the internet became available, huge amounts of information is now transferred around the world. Right. And many researchers from many different uh, nationalities are able to take a look at this data. They're thinking about it differently and all contributing to it. Yes. So yes. now we see this exponential growth in data. Mm -hmm. So for instance, in particular, the microglia, which is my area of interest, which is the innate immune system of the central nervous system, in the 1900, in 1990s, there was a textbook that uh, wrote that the microglia were virtually irrelevant and not of any concern. Mm -hmm. 16,000 papers later, by the mid-2000s, uh, it's apparent that the microglia are more than a little bit relevant and absolutely crucial in a huge range of functioning of the central nervous system. And our understanding of the brain has changed radically. We didn't know, for instance, that the brain could regenerate and, re and rebuild itself. Oh, wow. This concept of neuroplasticity yes. started, we really got the first data on that in the late uh, 1980s, mm -hmm. uh, and that's grown since. So it's been a sea change of, of information, really, in terms of since the 1990s, in terms of how to, how to look at how to heal the body, right? How Absolutely. Absolutely. You, I like this quote that you had of Leonardo da Vinci at the start of chapter one. You said, he said, study the art of science, learn how to see, realize that everything connects to everything else. I mean, when did scientists begin to follow da Vinci's lead? Not sure I can answer that question. Certainly, you know, if we, if we go back, so in medicine in particular, where we started a problem in medicine was with Descartes. Okay, so in Descartes, it's res cognate, res mente. So there's mind, there's body. That was actually a construct that allowed the Catholic Church, or gave, allowed the Catholic Church to give permission to medicine to move forward. And it said, okay, look, we'll take care of the soul. Okay, the body, we're not so concerned with, you can study that. Okay, okay. and that allowed for massive advances to occur. It allowed us to understand anatomy and, right. and dissections. And, but it created a split that was never real, the split between mind and body. Okay. And as we continued to move forward through the ages, we kept that split. And psychiatry kind of became relegated a little bit to the sidelines in, yes. in terms of conventional medicine. We're now that healing that split, and that's a large part of what's been going on through the 80s, the 90s, uh, and now recently. And particularly what we're finding is so in, with regards to chronic pain and depression, why those two? Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got over 100 million people in this country suffering with chronic pain. Depression, about 18 million people, but if you include things like post-traumatic stress syndrome, generalized anxiety disorders, uh, you end up with about 38 million people a year suffering with neuropsychiatric illness, mental illness. The problem is we are horrible at treating these conditions. Mm -hmm. Our success rate in treating depression is less than 50%. Yeah. Our success less, rate- Less than 15%? 50. 50, 50%. Five zero, okay. 50%, with a flat out failure rate of 40%. Ooh. The medications only work about a third of the time. Okay. With regards to uh, chronic pain, two of the leading causes of disability in this country, over 18 million people disabled as a result of chronic pain conditions. I found it interesting in your book, you, you have um, a couple whose 14 year old son, Billy, has mm -hmm. fallen from his snowboard and, and supposedly he, you know, he had surgery and he was healed, but he's in constant pain. Uh, in fact, uh, he, his injuries, injuries, injuries have not healed. So what happened to Billy? How, what, what, what's the case of how, how do you start to look at what, how to heal him? What, 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 mm -hmm. what does a doctor do? So this is the classic case with chronic pain. What happens is somebody sustains an injury and then the injury heals, but the pain continues. Mm -hmm. and the pain continues, and that's the definition of chronic pain, pain which continues beyond the expected point of healing. So it's, the pain is not just in the knee, but what, 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 what he twisted when he, when, he, when he fell off the snowboard. It was this pain is everywhere in his body, right? In Billy's case, so he originally develops what's called a complex regional pain syndrome. Complex which is swelling, regional pain syndrome. Right, okay. which is swelling and um, Basically, any kind of uh, stimulation to the skin over that area is going to be painful. So the light touch can be excruciatingly just painful. A, just a light touch anywhere in the body, so, right? Well, 
at first over the area of the knee where it okay. was. In Billy's case, it spread, it became a more complex and a more rare case, but it spread throughout the entire body. So now he's got a generalized pain syndrome. And again, allodynia, this is this uh, hypersensitivity to any kind of s air brushing over the skin or light touch in the skin. This became uh, the problem for him. And so now um, you can only imagine how miserable this poor kid was uh, and how much his parents were suffering trying to find some kind of a solution. So he had a, uh, they, a spinal tap, he had, he saw the, be the best and the brightest in terms of doctors, mm -hmm. and yet um, the, um, this, what, what, what happened, I mean, they were saying, they, they, they called the psychiatrist in because they thought he was just right. making it up, right? And unfortunately, that happens all too often. Well, we can't find a blood test, we can't find a scan that confirms the presence of your pain or your condition, we decide that the problem is psychiatric. Right. Okay. And. The problem is inflammation, and the problem is inflammation in the central nervous system. Okay. And that depression and chronic pain are manifestations. They are symptoms of inflammation in the central nervous system. I see. And then what we need to do is turn around and say, okay, what is it that caused the inflammation? Okay. So if I can give you an example, I had uh, one young uh, man who came to see me, a um, 17 year old, uh, severely depressed, uh, multiple hospitalizations, he had attempted suicide, and uh, was not responsive to any of the medications. We took the position that, okay, when we're looking at an inflammatory disease, what is it that potentially created the problem? After an extensive medical work on him, we found he had celiac disease. He's unable to tolerate any gluten whatsoever. Oh, wow. And in about 15% of cases of celiac disease, they manifest not as intestinal problems, okay, but they'll manifest as uh, neurologic problems, either with damage to the peripheral nerves or the headaches or uh, as depressions. But he, isn't, he was in physical pain though, right? He, he, he had, as well as being depressed, he was in physical pain. He had some physical pain, and, and this is different than Billy. Uh, this is another case that we saw recently. Mm -hmm. uh, but off, the, off gluten, uh, and with some other things that we did with him, he's actually starting to come off his antidepressant medications and heal from his depression. Okay, well let's, and you, you mentioned in your, also your book, that to be plagued by such intense suffering from a trivial injury with no possibility of relief is a prescription for despair. I mean, wasn't this problem prevalent in the American Civil War? This problem was originally uh, identified by Dr. Silas uh, during the American Civil War in patients who he had done amputations on and found that they continued to have pain despite the amputation. You mean, in other words, they had pain where, where the limb was no longer there? Limb was no longer, so they had phantom limb pain and then they developed uh, pain uh, further up on the limb and that he was unable to find any resolution for whatsoever. In other conditions, they had been wounded and despite the wounds healing, again, the pain continued. What can be done when you have this kind of problem? I mean, when you think about the wounded vets that may be coming back mm -hmm. with, have you had uh, uh, those kind of patients in your office? That we have. So again, you need to not get focused on the pain, but rather get focused on the person. Okay. So you need to look at pain as the end result of a process that's happened. And this is, this is one of the more, more important things we've discovered, is that if you stay focused on the event and you miss everything that happened beforehand. So in Billy's case, for instance, one of the things that happened with Billy was we found that he was susceptible to mold toxicity. Mold. Okay. So, so these are, but the toxins. So he's not allergic to mold itself, but he's allergic to the toxins that the molds produce. Okay and uh, his body can't clear them. Genetically, he misses the, he's missing the enzyme. So we okay. can do the blood test. We found that out on Billy and we said, okay, we know that as a result of mold exposure previously in his history, mm -hmm. okay, that his brain was actually already in an inflamed state uh, because of the mold toxicity. Okay. Subsequently, he undergoes this injury and now the injury goes the pain for the injury goes all out of control, out of proportion for mm -hmm. what it was. Mm -hmm. So originally it should be a fracture that heals and resolves, that doesn't happen in him, it moves on to this complex regional pain syndrome. But the setup was the mold toxicity in his case. Okay. In other people it's other things, and that's why you need to take a very comprehensive history and understand the whole process by which somebody got there. Okay. And look at the pain or the depression as the end result yeah, of that Yeah, very process. good. Well, now explain how the traditional medical approaches to chronic pain are limited to prescribing pain pills and antidepressants. I mean, what else can be done? Well, there's a huge amount that can be done if we redefine the problem. So if we define the problem as fibromyalgia, we define the problem as migraine, or we define the problem as uh, chronic low back pain or failed low back syndrome. 
uh, or we define the problem as osteoarthritis and call it a day, then all we're doing is we're looking at the symptom and we're not looking at the cause. Okay. So there's a wide range of things that we can do in order to treat the symptoms, but what we really want to do is get to the cause to resolve the problem. So, so you have to be like a Sherlock Holmes. You have to really try to find what are the causes of this problem, right? And the only way to go about doing that is to take the time to listen. Take you the have time. to take a very comprehensive history in order to understand how a person got to where they are in front of you today. That's yeah, interesting. And I also found it interesting to read in your book that uh, you know, so many people have sleep disorders. Uh, mm -hmm. You said that, you know, and you wrote that taking three sleeping pills in a week is linked to a five times greater risk of death. I mean, is that from a government study? Is that? Oh, that's from a large study, about 17,000 people that was published about two years ago. Uh, we have seen smaller studies linking the chronic use of uh, things like Ambien and Lunesta, um, Clonopin, on a regular basis to uh, much higher increased all-cause mortality. Uh, and we don't quite understand why that is, mm -hmm. uh, but it's unquestionably there. Uh, so it's been documented. So, so, so p should people switch to melatonin? Is that melatonin? Is that is that safe? So, well, we don't have the studies on melatonin. Okay. So what I would back up and suggest is, okay, let's again talk about cause. Why is it you're having trouble sleeping? What is it that's creating the problem? Mm -hmm. Are you having trouble starting sleep? Are you having problems staying asleep once you get there? Uh, and understand that issue and are there stresses going on in life that are creating problems for you mm -hmm. and address those uh, as a first line, okay? Okay, okay? Acupuncture can be effective uh, in helping people return to sleep, meditation, regular exercise. Those are things that can be done in order to help people in changes in diet. Well, you wrote that getting enough s uh, hours of sleep is important, but the quality of sleep we get is even more critical. Absolutely. I mean, w please explain it. I mean, taking these sleeping pills is not, you do fall asleep for eight hours, but you say the quality of sleep is not good then, That's right? Correct. So stage is divided into four stages, or okay. sleep is divided into four stages, uh, inclusive of a, uh, a REM period. And we need all of those stages in order to uh, our bodies to repair overnight. Okay, Our, so our bodies repair themselves overnight. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. And so if we're missing any of those stages, we're deficient in them, we're going to have problems. So for stage three, four sleep, slow wave sleep, is essential to resolve mm. muscular pain. And, if we, and we find in people with fibromyalgia deficiency in stage three, four sleep. The problem with the sleeping pills is that they give you quantitatively enough sleep, but not qualitatively sleep. So the amount of, in each stage is different and you're not getting adequate REM, you're not getting adequate slow wave sleep while you're taking these medications. Mm. So that's one of the problems. The other problem, however, is uh, sleep apnea, okay? And so about... Is that sleep, is that m mostly when people are snoring? Do you have sleep apnea? Is that... S snoring can absolutely be one of, the, one of the paramount signs of sleep apnea, but the issue is that people stop breathing while they're asleep. Mm. Okay, their oxygen levels drop in their bodies uh, tremendously, and uh, it can be life-threatening. I mean, basically, sleep apnea untreated can take 10 years off your life. Wow. It's responsible for high blood pressure, it's responsible for increased incidence of stroke, and so it really is something which is essential to get treated, and it makes pain worse, and it makes depression worse. Okay. So, uh, it's important that as part of the history, and any time we're talking to someone, that we take a good comprehensive sleep history and understand whether or not something like sleep apnea, which exists in about 5% of the population, yeah. and has only been diagnosed in about 15% of those people. Mm. So the overwhelming majority of people with sleep apnea have not been diagnosed. Ooh. And if you give those people sleeping pills, you make their sleep apnea worse. That you do. Ooh, I didn't know that. Well, I read an article recently that indicated that most American doctors feel like beaten dogs because of assembly line patient visits, stacks of paperwork, and endless red tape. It seems doctors are told to be more efficient, yet are, are distracted by the towering mountain of non-clinical tasks. I mean, is this affecting care for the chronically ill, and how can this be changed? Well, it's an unmitigated disaster of what's going on. It because is? now what's happening is we have the average physician at maximum spends eight minutes with a patient, wow. uh, which is barely enough time to get a, uh, say hello, uh, <laughs> get an understanding as to what the immediate problem is and write a script in order to resolve the, address the issue and leave. And that's, that's the full extent of it. You can't begin to get an understanding of uh, why a person is sitting in front of you and what happened to them. So uh, time is not valued in the insurance system. Procedures are, so guess what? We do a lot more procedures because those get reimbursed at a much higher rate than spending time with somebody. And so that whole shift has stopped us from taking the histories that we really are taught to take and need to take in order to get the full scope and understanding of what's happened with an individual and how we can best help them. What can the American public do to, to make this change? I mean, how can we, I guess we have to just write our congressman, right? <laughs> 
One of the things that has to happen is we've got to get insurance companies to value time as opposed to procedures. Okay. Okay. And so they've got to be paying more uh, for the time that a physician actually spends to be able to listen and collect all the information necessary to arrive at a proper diagnosis and then come up with a proper treatment plan for you. Things have to be individualized and we can't just do a cookie cutter. Yeah, right? yeah. And especially with chronic pain, my histories are an hour and a half to two hours long. It right. takes a long time for me to sit yes. down and get the full picture exactly. of what's going Exactly, especially on with someone who's 50 or 60 years old to give their life history of what happened. Absolutely. And, but and, you would be um, amazed with people like Billy that we run into the same problem where we need a long time because these poor kids have suffered so much and been right. through so much. And I saw, I saw, I thought it was very interesting, the impact of childhood abuse and emotional pain really compromises our immune system. You gave several excellent, excellent examples of people who had terrible health following a devastating loss mm -hmm. or uh, emotional grief. Uh, what is the connection between emotional and physical pain? So. The, so we know that in terms of the co-occurrence of pain and depression, the answer is about 50 to 65 percent. So about 50 to 65 percent of people who suffer with depression will also suffer with pain and vice versa. And that's emotional pain? Emotional pain, okay. onset as a result of childhood abuse, onset as a result of post-traumatic stress syndrome. And post-traumatic stress syndrome, by the way, the leading cause of post-traumatic stress syndrome, car accidents. Car accidents. Car accidents. The Ooh. high, about 50 percent of people uh, after a car accident will experience some level of post-traumatic stress syndrome for about a year afterwards, and about 25% of those people will go on. It could uh, be a minor car problem. accident, right? It can Just be. Like, maybe like a whiplash or something, right? It can Just, be. Okay. Um, th does this emotional abuse cause inflammation of the brain? Yes, absolutely. And the studies are now showing that long-term stress, aside from acute severe stress such as a rape, actually damages the neurons in the brain. We actually get degeneration. That incites an inflammatory reaction, which is the repair action on the part of the microglia in the central nervous system. But that chronic uh, stress ends up with chronic damage to the neurons and chronic inflammation, which ends up with more damage to the neurons. And now what we have is loss of brain matter. So we actually see your brains getting smaller. The longer that process goes on, the harder it is to repair. But then what do people do that are, that are harboring this horrible emotional stress? Do they need to see an, uh, a psychiatrist or an analyst to, to, to talk this out? Or was it, what, 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 is the, what, what should someone do that's suffering from this? Without question, uh, working with a therapist, a good therapist, is essentially okay. part of everything that we do in, in the process of working with our individuals. Now, not everybody needs that, but those who need it, we make sure get it. So if I can give you another example, we had one woman who came to see me uh, when she was 30 years old. She had had a whiplash injury when she was 18 from mm -hmm. a car accident mm -hmm. and then developed fibromyalgia, this generalized pain syndrome. Right. So she had been unsuccessfully treated over a number of years. Mm -hmm. My belief is that, okay, this was the event. What was the setup? And so as we pushed back in her history and we took more time with her and talking with her, what we found was that she had some sleep disturbances, had had problems uh, staying asleep, had problems with nightmare. And then what she finally revealed was at age 11, she had been raped. Mm -hmm. And she had never told anybody about this before. Okay. And she broke down and she's sobbing. And we had a conversation about this. And this poor woman's been suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome since age 11. Wow. And that was the setup that the whiplash injury now devolves into this whole generalized pain problem. Okay. So. Anything that sets off inflammation in the central nervous system can potentially manifest as the symptoms of pain or depression or anxiety disorders mm. or generalized fatigue or problems with focus and concentration, headaches, uh, or sleep disturbances. So all of that, all of these are symptoms of inflammation in the central but nervous I system. I don't think this is well known in, in the general public. Do you think this is well known? It's not well known in the general public, and it's why Andy said uh, the work that I was uh, publishing was, uh, was a bit groundbreaking. Uh, it is, there's plenty of literature on it. So the research, the basic science literature is there to support this and gets stronger and stronger each year. Since the book has been published, uh, there's been a number of review articles uh, summarizing the neuroimmune mm -hmm. uh, connection. And the, the fact of the matter is, this is how we need to view things. We need to see these things as symptoms, as uh, symptoms of inflammation of the central nervous system. And there's a the whole variety of things that set off that inflammatory process, right. from mold toxins to things like Lyme disease, uh, to conditions like sleep apnea, uh, head traumas. Uh, yeah, or, or, or emotional traumas. When, when emotional you, traumas, yeah, absolutely. Right. Okay. Now, why do people put up with so many aches and pains? And you write that most people feel they're getting older and what they're feeling is just nature taking its course, that there's nothing they can do about it. Is that true? 
I, I don't believe so. I think that that's what we've been told. And I think that uh, it's a function of looking, look, we don't have all the answers by any means, but we right. have a whole bunch more answers today than we had 10 years ago, or mm. even five years ago. Fantastic. And much better solutions. And so I think that a lot of the pain that people put up with is something that we could in fact do something about, but they need to s see somebody who actually knows how to manage that kind of pain. Yes, yes. 92% of Americans may have deficiencies in essential vitamins and minerals. I mean, what are the worst vitamin mineral deficiencies that we have, you think? Well, the number one is vitamin D. Vitamin D. Vitamin D is essential, and vitamin D is a bit, mis a bit misnomer because it's actually a hormone. It has wide-ranging effects throughout the entire and body. And that, that, that's sunlight, right? Vitamin D comes Vitamin D is made in our skin in reaction to sunlight. And for most of us, we don't live outdoors anymore. What we do is we live behind a computer screen. Right. <laughs> And so, and they were told to wear were to wear sunscreen so we won't get wrinkles, right? Exactly correct. The end result of which is we don't make vitamin D, and we end up with vitamin D deficiency. Vitamin D deficiency is rampant, about seventy percent of the North American population, and it results in an impaired immune system. In the, in the central nervous system, this is the microglia again, but basically your immune system still works. So you have higher probability of catching colds and flus, but you also at increased risk of developing certain cancers Ooh. because the immune system is necessary in order to remove cancer cells. I see. And so if the immune system is not functioning well, then you're increased risk for cancers as well as other infections. Well, and what about minerals? Is, are there any minerals that we're low on? Is, mag is it magnesium? Magnesium, is magnesium is one in particular that we find women in particular because of their menstrual periods. Uh, magnesium deficiency uh, can result in generalized pain problems, it can result in headaches, it can result in sleep disturbances, uh, and so we find that that is also extremely common uh, in the population that we see. Amazing. Well, you said there are critical tests you cite in your book which include checking for Lyme disease, checking for chronic Epstein-Barr virus, I'm sorry, Epstein-Barr virus, mm -hmm. biotoxicity, sleep disorders, and a thyroid test. Mm -hmm. Why is a thyroid test so important? So hypothyroidism uh, can result in problems with your metabolism. It can result in problems with your sleep. It can result in problems with your ability to focus and concentrate. Mm -hmm. And so there's a percentage of people that have thyroid disease that have not, not been yet diagnosed. Okay. So, and it's an easy test to do. It's a matter of a quick blood test. Uh, we recommend that both the thyroid stimulating hormone be measured along with the free T3 and the free T4 because that gives us a more complete understanding of what's going on with thyroid metabolism. What are, what are like three things people should know before selecting a doctor? Well, one thing they should know is that they need to find somebody who will take the time to listen to them. Yes. Uh, so you need to know that you're going to be able to sit and, and, and be talked to. The second is you need to know somebody who has expertise in the problem you have. So you need to find out what their background is. If you know, Family physicians are not well trained in the management of chronic pain, unfortunately. And so you need to find out whether or not you've got somebody who is well trained in, ma in pain management. Well, unfortunately, Dr. Kaplan, we are running out of time. Uh -huh. So where can our viewers find your book? So the book can be purchased online on Amazon, they can be purchased through Barnes & Noble, and they can be purchased through our website at www.kaplanclinic.com. Great. Thank you so much for being with us. Lois, thank you for having me. And thank you for watching. Please join us again next month for a new edition of The Bookman's Corner. I'm Lois Lindstrom.